Good evening, I'm Wendy Mesley, and this is The National. Hundreds of wildlife species in Canada are dying off and fast. The decline is very serious. A new report tells us why and whether it can be turned around. Susan Ormiston with the view from Florida. Look at the damage that Hurricane Irma brought to this area. And how are Canadians doing money-wise? Who's better off than before and who's not? When Canadians speak proudly of their country, they often talk about the raw beauty of Canada's wilderness and diverse wildlife. But tonight, new research shows that wildlife is in deep decline. The 45-year 40 year survey of more than 900 species in Canada found mammal populations dropped 43%, amphibians and reptiles 34%, and fish populations dropped 20%. The research also identifies the cause of those declines and looks at what, if anything, can be done to reverse the damage done. Margot McDermott has the details. It's one of Canada's iconic species, a familiar shape on our quarter, a symbol of vast northern spaces. But most of the caribou herds in the country are now in serious trouble a four-legged furry canary in the coal mine. Caribou require wilderness, and when caribou are moving out of an area, we are losing that wilderness. It's happening a lot, according to a new report by the World Wildlife Fund of Canada. It's produced the country's first ever look at wildlife trends over the past 45 years. The news isn't good. More than half of the 903 species it monitored are declining fast. And amongst those, the decline is very serious with populations being over 80% on average uh, below what they once were. The problems vary across the country. On all three coasts, whales are in trouble. On the prairies, grassland birds are dying off. In Ontario and Quebec, amphibians like turtles and frogs have disappeared from ponds and lakes. In Atlantic Canada, fish populations are dropping. Scientists say there's a list of reasons. Habitat loss, contamination, pollution, pesticides, uh, invasive species, climate change, and overharvesting. But the report blames some of it on the Federal Species at Risk Act, too. It's supposed to spot animals in trouble and protect them. Yet, the WWF says the act is overly bureaucratic and slow. We would deploy this on females. For example, it's taken the federal government 15 years to craft a plan to protect caribou. Where they were in trouble uh, 15 years ago, they continue to be in trouble, and in some cases uh, on the verge of uh, extirpation. Others say you can't blame one federal law for a complex problem. The provincial governments are implicated as much in species decline as, are, as is the federal government. The report says there are things that can help, like doing more research into how wildlife is affected by climate change and moving quickly to protect entire ecosystems instead of a species here and there. And it warns the longer we leave it, the more dramatic the loss in wildlife will be. Margaret McDermott, CBC News, Ottawa. Last year, the Living Planet Index revealed global populations of fish, birds, mammals, amphibians and reptiles declined by 58 percent between 1970 and 2012. And it feared there could be a two-thirds decline by 2020. The shock of Hurricane Irma may have passed, but recovery has barely begun for millions of people across the Caribbean and South Florida, especially the Florida Keys, which took an incredible blow. Only now are some people getting back to have a look at what's left, if anything at all. Susan Ormiston reports from one region that was all but wiped out by the storm. Florida slips into the sea at its southern tip on this strip of small islands. Driving south, there's a clue to Irma's fury. Soon, you can see her sheer force as the hurricane ripped a swath through here just four days ago. A trailer park in Big Pine Key took a wallop, its innards exposed, mobile homes ripped open like cans and flipped in the tumultuous winds. 
This is by far the worst sustained damage we've seen on our trip south into the Florida Keys. It's the size of it, the scope of it. Other places have lots of damage, but some here, some there, not indiscriminate like this. Just up the road in Marathon, the winds warped steel, tossed boats like bathtub toys. We find Ember Jackson, a resident who waited out the storm. It just kept coming, you know, like every few minutes you'd feel the whole building just boom, you know, and it was. She sent us round to her place, which stayed intact, but all around, complete destruction. The trailers on the canal pushed in, once waterside homes now submerged. Why do you think your home survived? So I've been trying really hard to do the right thing and I think God noticed. There's plenty of cleanup work, weeks, maybe months. We saw long lines of recovery workers, the army, even drug enforcement officers for security. The U.S. military is loading up choppers with supplies and equipment to get to some of the harder to reach spots. Rescuers are going door to door. One told us unofficially they have found bodies down here. He wouldn't say how many. In Kajo Key, where Irma first hit, Delane and James Lowry were spared the worst. You stayed here? Of course. Were you nervous? Really? No, no, we're, 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 we're spiritual people, so my guides had already told me we would be okay. They've survived multiple hurricanes. There's even a window to watch, but with the family worried, they've asked us to call. Okay, my sister's number is, uh, uh, her name is Barb Blowers, B-L-O-W-E-R-S, and her number is uh, 330. I had to use a sledgehammer to get the gate open. So. Okay. All right, well, we'll do what okay. we can. Thank you, thank care. you, I appreciate it. We okay. have to leave. A strict dusk to dawn curfew locks down the keys. Vulnerable still. Susan Ormiston, CBC News in the Florida Keys. Now, despite the colossal damage throughout the Florida Keys, the U.S. has incredible resources to draw on for crises like this, which is not the case for other countries affected by the storm. The tiny island nation of Barbuda, which remains effectively deserted, is looking at a massive recovery bill. Their prime minister warns it could be over $350 million, a drop in the bucket by American standards, but an astronomical sum for a tiny population of 1,800 people. The huge and dangerous wildfire in southwest Alberta along the B.C. border seems to have hit the brakes at least in terms of growth, thanks to light rains and cooler weather. But officials warn it is still considered out of control. The so-called Kenal wildfire has grown remarkably fast this week, quadrupling in size in just three days, from roughly 110 square kilometres on Monday to well over 400 square kilometres now. That's about four times the size of Lethbridge. Our Carolyn Dunn has the latest on the situation tonight. Our first glimpse of the blackened, still smoky crust the fire left on some land here in southern Alberta. At least five homes and several other structures have been burned in areas too dangerous for us to get in to see. At this time, as of right now, no other ho houses have been lost. So any, anybody that's still wondering should be able to um, have a little bit of a sigh of relief. The fire started with a lightning strike two weeks ago and has since exploded in size. Local states of emergency and partial evacuations remain in effect for several areas. Late today, residents of the Blood Reserve, Canada's largest reserve, were told it is now safe for them to return home. But Waterton Lakes National Park is closed. And while firefighters have managed to keep the town site safe, its visitor centre burned to the ground. So did most of the Heartland Ranch, a 30-year family business that sits on the border of the park. Outside the National Park, much of the land in the fire zone is agricultural. So there's serious concern about the danger to livestock. Southern Alberta Livestock in Fort McLeod opened its gates to more than 100 cattle that area ranchers managed to get out. We got to be good people and you got to be good to everybody and whether it's animal or human. Other ranchers simply opened their gates hoping their animals will move to safety if the fire spreads. And despite a break in the weather, that's still a possibility. I would like to stress that this fire is still active. There are still very dry fuels out there. 
After seeing heavy smoke and fire just 15 kilometers from their home, Murray and Elaine White are ready to get out. So I've uh, packed up all my important papers, got them in bins, um, a little bit of food and uh, things for my animals, and that's what's most important, plus the husband. <laughs> You gonna take me? <laughs> yes. Seems a little humor helps with all the stress. <laughs> Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, near Waterton Lakes National Park. Coming up, why the Trudeau tax plan is facing an angry backlash, even from his own party. And people uh, prefer not to remember this place. So why does this Canadian make it her job not to forget? According to the Syrian government and its ally, Russia, the Syrian civil war is now in its endgame. The government is capturing more territory by the day. ISIS is collapsing in the country. And in the interests of showing what Moscow-engineered liberation looks like, Russia is taking journalists on a tour of the country. Today, CBC's Chris Brown is in Homs, which saw some of the fiercest fighting of the war, but is now mostly in government hands. We're on day two of our tour, the Russian-led tour of Syria, and uh, they've taken us to what they're calling a de-escalation zone. Take a look over here to my left, a very uh, chaotic scene, a load of Russian trucks uh, with food and other supplies that's just pulled in, and uh, as you can see, there's a mad dash uh, by everyone to try to get uh, what they're bringing. Uh, this is a, a, a crucial point. We're right in between, uh, we're almost in no man's land. We're right in between land held by the Syrian government and uh, to my left, the, uh, the free Syrian army. And so what can happen here is this is a, a zone that's been created for people on both sides to be able to come and get access to some of the food relief that's, that's being brought. Um, and it has been it has been fairly quiet, and then when the trucks came in, it uh, it obviously got, uh, got got fairly busy. The Russian military invited foreign journalists on this tour to show what they're doing to try to end the war, both from a humanitarian point of view and also uh, on the battlefield as well. We've been to their military base, we've visited some schools, and, and in general, it's been a fairly staged event with people saying fairly predictable things. This is much more of a organic, unrehearsed event. Chris Brown, CBC News in Homs, Syria. In Syria, getting the story is extremely difficult. Journalists rely on hard to verify sources and amateur video or go there themselves under the watchful eyes of one side or another. As you heard, Chris's reporting from Syria was facilitated by the Russian government. But over more than five years of civil war, CBC and our colleagues at Radio Canada have been there several times to get different pieces of the puzzle. The armed insurrection we're seeing in homes, for example, is at risk of spreading. When the uprising was just months old, Susan Ormiston reported from Damascus with the regime's blessing, but captured the views of the opposition by night. In the suburbs of Damascus, people group, come and protest against the Assad government. In the early stage of what became a full-blown civil war, Sasha Petrusik was able to get into the opposition-held side of Aleppo. The government itself is not in a position to move forward, but it is holding the FSA back. It's a stalemate. Last year, Margaret Evans covered the same city from the Syrian government side. There is a pocket of opposition soldiers dug in. The Syrian armed forces just took this neighborhood back last week. In Syria, every side looks for good spin. Unspinning the war takes context and persistence. The Canadian economy may be doing better than it has for a long time, but neither the Prime Minister nor the Finance Minister have been able to bask in it. Their cabinet retreat and economically depressed St. John's has been dominated by tax talk, the plan to end certain tax practices, the fear it will hurt struggling small businesses, and the cracks it's now causing in Liberal ranks. David Cochran explains. The signs of the provincial recession are obvious in downtown St. John's, and the local business community is worried these tax changes will only make things worse. 
they're angry, they're worried. I mean, individuals are concerned. These are such wide sweeping proposals that are there. So while the government preaches fairness, small businesses worry about fallout. They say the Trudeau tax plan is so big and moving so fast, there is no way to fully grasp the consequences of these changes. They're all pretty busy. Are they? That's the deal. The finance minister met with them privately to hear their concerns, but it did nothing to brighten the mood. It's like someone built a boat and there's leaks in it, and they know there's leaks in it, and they're putting the boat in the water and they're going, when I get in the water, I'll figure out where the leaks are too. I'll fix them then. We're out talking to Canadians this month. We're listening in our consultation process. That's, uh, we think, very important. It's something that will continue. It is not a consultation, in my opinion. I think he very much has checked the box today, that he spoke with the business people of St. John's, but I really don't think he's listened. The unrest is also coming from inside the Liberal caucus, as MPs are breaking ranks with the Cabinet. Wayne Easter, the Liberal chair of the Finance Committee, called the communications of the tax plan god-awful and said whoever drafted it doesn't have a clue about small businesses. Other MPs have publicly said this is being rushed and the consultations should be extended. The Prime Minister wouldn't agree to that and he insists the tax reforms aren't as bad as critics say. Our support of small businesses and the communities they live in, our support for the middle class, remains unflinching. The problem is that this liberal outburst comes just as Parliament is set to resume. The Conservatives were already poised to hit the government with the concerns of farmers and doctors and small business owners, and now they can hit them with the words of their own MPs. David Cochran, CBC News, St. John's. The Defence Minister says Canada will not be rushed into a new peacekeeping mission. Clearly, it's been more than a year since the government committed up to 600 peacekeepers to NATO. For that, Canada got to host a NATO peacekeeping summit scheduled for November. But as Murray Brewster tells us, the lack of mission is causing no lack of confusion and concern. The United Nations has bombarded Canada with requests for UN peacekeepers. Enter the Trudeau government, which appears to be shopping for the right opportunity. We need to make sure that we're doing it right, that we're doing it in a thoughtful way, and that it's the right mission. When we send troops uh, anywhere, we want to make sure that we have, or we're making a right uh, uh, decision here. Uh, we want to have the right impact. So what is the right mission? Defence sources tell CBC News in choosing a country, the priority is that there should be a peace to keep. If there is no peace, there must be a good chance of peace in the near term. In other words, Canada wants to contribute to peace and security, not simply babysit a civil war. Last spring, CBC News obtained an internal D&D list that tracks peacekeeping requests. Mali was the subject of multiple asks, yet the International Crisis Group says it remains on a trajectory towards greater violence and widening instability. In the Central African Republic, lasting peace is still some way off. And the Democratic Republic of Congo, prospects for a peaceful transfer of power look increasingly remote. Having some kind of plan for peace underway is paramount to the success of peacekeeping missions, according to someone who's been there. You don't send troops uh, or forces or even consider peacekeeping unless you have the political consideration in place. In regards to peacekeeping, uh, we will uh, continue to reflect on uh, the best way to do it. That may be, but at least one expert says the international community has shrugged and moved on, with Germany, France and Britain stepping into the void Canada was supposed to fill. It was a mistake, I think, to make a really, really strong and really high-profile promise of peacekeepers without knowing how to implement it. Richard Gowan also says all of the dithering likely has not cost Canada its shot at a UN Security Council seat. But the impact of the peacekeeping deployment, when it comes, likely won't be as great as what it could have been. Marie Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. A 35-year-old RCMP officer was killed last night trying to do a good deed. Constable Frank Deschen had stopped on a highway in New Brunswick to help two people change a flat tire. A third vehicle slammed into his cruiser and the other car. The officer died at the scene. The two people he was helping and the driver of the third vehicle were taken to hospital, treated and released. It's not clear if charges will be laid in the case. Straight ahead on The National, a Canadian premier testifies at a bribery trial.
John Lennon is here in Canada selling peace. He is here in our studio tonight, along with Yoko and Rabbi Abraham Feinberg from Holy Blossom Temple. John, you've been terribly flattering to Canada since you've been around this week. And Vice I'm just versa. wondering how you can define that strain that seems to run through our national character. We, we say we have an inferiority complex in this country. What is it about Canada? Why is this peace movement being held here? I d you know, it's, it's like beyond, beyond me, uh, the ins and outs of it, why we, we're here doing these things in Canada. I can say things like, I know Canada wants to talk to China and all those things, but they're not exactly the point. It's something else that I can't, it's, I can't define it. Probably but we came, meant to be like it's like, it's meant to be, we can only say it's mm -hmm. like, it's meant to be. But we came to Montreal first time for the bed-in, by mistake, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I don't want to be insulting, but it happened by mistake. We ended up in Montreal. How by I, mistake? You mean you just well, we, originally we were planning to go to one place and we went, and then we went, ended up in the Bahamas, and then from the Bahamas we headed to Toronto and ended up in Canada. And our, our plan, we didn't have a, a plan. We ended up in Montreal doing a bed-in. By chance. By chance. Say, yes. And then we met a lot of nice people, you know. And of course we meet millions of people. Canada is the first country that we've had been given help with well, our movement. Every yeah. other, most people that approach us want something. Canada is the first place that has given us something. For instance, the media and the press treat us as human beings, mm -hmm. yes. which is, I'm astonished. They're very strict. I'm not used to it. We're you know. very thankful. About well, we, we have always been, or at least we've considered ourselves to be uh, a peace-loving nation and uh, mediators to some extent. Uh, I'd, I would like to know why you wouldn't choose a, a place where war is going on right now or where there is a dispute in progress. Uh, Vietnam, the Middle East. Because Canada chose us as much as we chose Canada. <laughs>
This is Investors Group Field, home of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. It's where they play their home games. It's also where they practice. And those practices are about to change. In a new edict to all CFL teams, full contact during practices is now banned as the league tries to reduce hits that can lead to concussions and other injuries. Previously, they were allowed 17 full contact practices per season, basically one per week. For years, the CFL has been criticized for not taking scientific evidence showing the long-term negative health effects of concussions seriously enough. Now its newly appointed commissioner and former player, Randy Ambrosi, says the league wants to be a leader when it comes to player safety. The game is, is uh, uh, always going to evolve. There's always going to be something we didn't know before that we know now. There's always should be an emphasis on making these, uh, making these improvements where we can. The league is also stretching its schedule to 19 weeks to allow players an extra week off during the season. The moves are being met positively by CFL players and coaches. Football is a contact sport and, and you know, today, uh, you know, the knowledge that we know, the, uh, the prevention that we know, uh, you know, the, the equipment is so much better, the rules are so much better. The Canadian Concussion Centre says this is a good idea. By avoiding unnecessary hits in practice, concussions will be avoided. It also says this is an example to other pro and amateur leagues in other contact sports. Meanwhile, a concussion lawsuit against the CFL was just thrown out by the BC Court of Appeal. That decision is now being appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada. The lawyer in that case says this is a step in the right direction, but that the CFL could have made it a lot sooner. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. Big news for baseball fans today. Cleveland took its winning streak into the record books. For four on the afternoon. Swings at the first pitch and a line drive to left field. That's the longest winning streak in American League history. One more than the 2002 Oakland A's. And the longest winning streak in all of Major League Baseball, 26, by the 1916 New York Giants. There's still lots ahead tonight. You know, we have one kind of poverty now, but you haven't seen anything yet. A new report reveals which Canadians are suffering financially. Inside a controversial historical attraction with a dark past. And remembering a giant in Canadian politics. That's all coming up on The National. Time now for the day's business numbers. The TSX dropped 16 points. The dollar fell two tenths of a cent. In New York, the Dow was still on its record high, gaining 39 points. The price of oil jumped $1.07 a barrel. A new disease with some old familiar symptoms has struck teenage girls around the world. The disease is called Duranitis, and the symptoms are screaming, swooning, and tears of ecstasy. It strikes whenever the British rock band Duran Duran appears. This week, thousands of Calgary teenagers fell victim when Duran Duran opened its North American tour in that city. Marion Kumi reports. <laughs> Andy, Nick, John, and Roger are Duran Duran, a popular British rock group. They've been dubbed the Fab Five, but such comparisons to the Beatles aren't because the music is similar, it's because of the girls. there's been music aimed at young people, there have been screaming fans. They swooned over Frank Sinatra in the 40s. In the 60s, fans created a new word, Beatlemania, for their love of John, Paul, George, and Ringo. Today, they're called Durani. Very, very dedicated to us. And they hang around in hotels, waiting for us to come down and follow us when we go out shopping, things like that. And we certainly have a lot of young fans, and I wouldn't swap them for anything in the world. What's wrong with 14-year-old girls? 
15-year-old Lori Evans and 17-year-old Julia Kim are dedicated Duran Duran fans. They've read all the articles ever written on their idols. Lori's room is full of posters, pictures, buttons, all the records, even Duran Duran's shoes. I used to think that people who had posters and, and listened to and bought all the albums were a little bit spinny and not quite in touch with reality and were groupies. But then when Duran Duran came along, it didn't seem like that. I'm not quite sure why, actually. Because I'm supposed to be the stable type, like not go crazy over Duran Duran or, you know. And so do you, do you think it makes you seem unstable because you really like a rock group? Yeah, they're seeing the other side of me. More than 8,000 Duran Duran fans, most of them under 18, went to the Olympic Saddle Dome to hear what the band calls their music without a message. They willingly lined up to buy $25 sweatshirts and other souvenirs, and then pushed their way into $15 seats to await their heroes. Ladies and gentlemen of Canada, this gathering tonight is the beginning of our North American tour. Do you get tired of being associated with, you know, their five great-looking guys? I get a bit, um, I think sometimes well, I've got a little bit more to offer than just that. Some rock critics say that to become a long-term success, Duran Duran will have to change its image as a teeny bopper group. But for now, they remain young, good-looking, clean-cut, well-dressed, musically adept, full of catchy, danceable tunes, the stuff teen fantasies are made of. Possibly the best concert in the history of civilization as we know it, okay? It was awesome. It was unbelievable, and Simon Le Bon is so gorgeous, it isn't even funny. Right on the border of NATO countries, within hours, Russia is set to hold its most extensive military exercises since 2013. And these days, that has lots of people nervous. Russia says the exercises are purely defensive, involving 13,000 troops in Russia, Belarus, and the Russian-held enclave of Kaliningrad. NATO says they are far larger than advertised. Lithuania and Latvia in particular are watching with unease. Russia casts a long shadow there, and before Chris Brown left for Syria, he was in Latvia, where fears about Moscow's next move live alongside a painful debate over the mark Russia's already made on the country. In the heart of Latvia's capital, Riga, there's a memorial to freedom. It's a place to remember resistance to oppression. The Russians, the Nazis, and then the Russians as the Soviet Union all controlled this Baltic country over the past century. But the Soviets were here the longest, five decades, and at times their rule was brutal. So these doors are specifically built by the KGB. Uh, it's a garage door where trucks would back in and the bodies that were executed in the chamber in here would have, would have been wrapped up and then dumped into the truck to be taken away. Aya Abins is showing us the old Riga headquarters of the Soviet secret police, the feared KGB. This was the execution room. It's a very small room, um, yes, and it was uh, purposefully built. It was soundproofed and had rubberized fabric put around uh, the walls to be able to clean up. Uh, more, uh, more easily. Anyone seen as a threat to Soviet ideology in any way could end up here. 186 people were shot in this room over a six-month period in 1941. So this is what we call the exercise yard. Abbins is a coordinator at the museum. She's also a Canadian. She taught history in Toronto for 20 years before returning to Latvia after it regained its independence in 1990. Some people uh, prefer not to remember this place because it may, be, may remind them of horrible memories that people just don't want to remember. Abbins has made it her job to ensure Latvians 
don't forget their past, especially with all that's happening now. Russia! In 2014, Russia took back Crimea from Ukraine, which most of the world saw as illegal. Its military also intervened in eastern Ukraine, moves that created anxiety in the Baltics over Russia once again. So, Latvia called on NATO for help. 450 Canadian troops arrived over the summer and set up a base outside of Riga. You know, with, with what happened in uh, 2014 with the you know, aggressive actions of Russia and Crimea, Ukraine, you know, the, the heads of state of, of NATO nations decided to actually put soldiers on the ground, which is, I think, the most clear message you could send, that uh, we are committed together as an alliance to, to defend uh, ourselves and our allies. The Canadians, though, have arrived in a country still divided over Russia and its role in Latvia's past. Canada's Latvian hosts have a complicated relationship with Russia. More than a third of the country speaks Russian and has Russian loyalties. And there's no consensus here on what to call that long period of Soviet rule. Most do call it an occupation, but many others prefer more benign terms, such as incorporation. First prisoners were brought here in uh, November of 1940. Uh, For Aya Abins, there is no ambiguity. This place was packed. Uh, cells that are meant for one person or two people often had six and seven people in it. The KGB building is now preserved as part of what's called the Museum of Occupation. It was clearly an occupation when it began. Uh, the Soviets came in 1940 saying that they were liberating Latvians from the bourgeois government. And then they returned in 1944 to say that they were liberating Latvia from uh, Nazi occupiers. Liberators usually go home. They never went home. Since Crimea, there's been a noticeable ramping up of occasions remembering those dark Soviet times. This ceremony paid tribute to the victims of one of Stalin's most egregious crimes, the deportation of 15,000 Latvians to Siberia in 1941. Those horrors are depicted in a powerful new film, the Chronicles of Melanie tells the true story of a Latvian woman in 1941, transported thousands of kilometers by train and then sent off into the wilderness. It portrays appalling conditions that the deportees lived in and the women's fight to avoid starvation and death. It was a nightmarish experience that Dinah Gurkha lived through herself. Now 88 years old, her memories of having her life ripped apart are incredibly sharp. I'm afraid even now of Russia, she says, because they think Latvia is theirs. In 1941, when the Soviets moved into Latvia, Gerka was 11 years old. Her father, an influential businessman, was on the local city council, and that fact alone made him a potential threat to Stalin's regime. We were given two hours to pack and to bring as much as we could carry. Her siblings and mother were separated from their father and sent thousands of kilometers from home. They were left to fend for themselves in a collective farm that could barely grow anything. Her father was shot. Gurkha says her mother starved to death so that her children could eat her meager food rations. My mother died in the second winter. We lived because we were brought to an orphanage. At an orphanage, Erika says she got enough food to survive, and in 1946 she returned to Latvia. Now she says she tells her story, hoping that Latvia will never experience a Russian occupation again. Unfortunately, you cannot rely on Russians. You can't trust what they say. Ethnic Latvians make up two-thirds of this country's population, and Russia as an occupier is how most people see it. But lots of ethnic Russians live here too, 
the Russian media and culture influences everything. This is Yarmala, a stunning beachside community about 45 minutes outside of Riga on the Baltic. In Soviet times, it was a favorite holiday destination for Moscow's elite. It remains popular with Latvia's ethnic Russian population. People such as Gennady Kashko. Well, what is an occupation, really? Latvia was one of the Soviet republics that actually lived very well. People considered it to be practically like being in a foreign country. They were worse off in Russia than Latvia. So if it was an occupation, it should have been worse here, right? Not the opposite. We spoke to elders Nagivs and his friends who are Russian-speaking Latvians. He told us while many believe the Soviet era was repressive, he does not. Now NATO is here. Well, this is in its own way a type of occupation. People from another country with their army come to your land and start to dictate how to do things. So maybe in 90 years they will call this an occupation too. And he offered this insight into Canada's role here. In Canada, it's much simpler. It's independent. It's been on its own a long time. It's in a territory no one is planning to occupy. It just cooperates with the U.S. and that's good for them, and it sends off its army. But if Canada wanted troops to come from France or Latvia, well, I don't think the people of Canada would look at this positively. Здравствуйте, я русский оккупант. Это моя профессия. Так сложилось исторически. Russia is eager to exploit the divisions in Latvia and to destabilize the NATO mission. Да, я оккупант. This video is a sophisticated propaganda effort. The sarcastic voice states that Russia occupied the Baltic countries and then built power plants, factories, and created luxuries for those who lived here. But after the Russians left, it says many Latvians now clean toilets for other Europeans. Европе. In Latvia, such thoughts have found an attentive audience. Mr. President, uh, hello. my name is Chris Brown, I'm with the Canadian Broadcasting yeah. Corporation. All the more reason Latvia's President Raimonds Fionis told us to have Canadians here. It is important that uh, Canadian troops and also other troops uh, of uh, NATO forces uh, will send a very strong signal uh, to our society that uh, we are not alone, we are together with our friends. And secondly, it will be a very strong signal to our neighbor uh, that uh, we are ready for everything. In the old KGB building, there's a book and it contains the names of tens of thousands of Latvians arrested or deported by the Soviets. That is my grandfather's brother. The names of some of Aya Abin's relatives are in there. For her, the discussion over how to characterize Russia's rule is deeply personal. Nature does this for us. They, it makes us forget the terrible things that have happened in our life. And there are some people who are nostalgic for the Soviet era, but uh, they certainly weren't the people who spent any time here. The steel doors and razor wire here represent the worst of the Soviet experience in Latvia. But whether it's the way Latvians should see Russia now continues to divide this place. Chris Brown, CBC News, in Riga, Latvia. Coming up next, the latest look at how Canadians' incomes are faring and who should be concerned. <laughs> It has been a wet and deadly 36 hours in northeastern Quebec. All day, local radio has been warning people in dozens of specific areas to leave their homes. And if they can't drive out, signal helicopters flying overhead so they can be flown out. At least seven people are dead, several more are missing, and thousands more have been forced to flee. A minister in the Quebec government described the situation in this region as apocalyptic, catastrophic. For more than a day, torrents of water have crashed through villages, towns and cities, 
taking houses, in some cases, entire buildings with it. Like clockwork, every five minutes a helicopter lands, bringing refugees from the flood. These people are from Grand Bay. It was terrible, like a hell. This is what they're escaping, hundreds of homes drowning in mud, hanging by a thread, or giving in to the relentless river. No one knows how many bridges and roads have collapsed, and the landmarks wiped out. This old pulp mill reopened as a museum just two weeks ago. Now it's a $6 million write-off. This disaster is unprecedented in Canada, and so is the relief fund, the largest ever collected by the Red Cross. The money has come from people all over the country, and this region knows it. Same with the destruction. The cars buried under mud, the homes swept out into the river, whole neighborhoods gone. That one house with the now famous foundation that alone resisted. Things people here will never forget, their disaster and the charity of others. Good evening, it's official now. The F-18A has won the fighter plane contract. The winning McDonnell Douglas 18A will cost $15 million a copy and is almost certain to be a highly controversial buy. General Dynamics, makers of the F-16 and the losing company in this competition, has issued a statement saying the benefits it offered were higher than the government gave it credit for, and that the price of the plane the government has bought will go up because of continued problems with it. For all of its weaponry, the toughest battle the F-18 Hornet may ever have to face is the barrage of poor publicity it's now attracting. Its costs have been climbing, and some media reports have described the Hornet as a lemon. Earlier this year, the U.S. General Accounting Office blasted the plane. It was nearly a ton overweight, its undercarriage was faulty, it had problems of drag, reduced engine thrust, range, and its acceleration was below specifications. Canada now has nearly 40 of them and expects to buy 100 more. Each of them costs 30 to 40 million dollars. Today it was revealed that the CF-18 and its American cousins of the United States Navy have the same problem. Cracks have started to appear in the tail section when the fighter does the combat maneuvers it was designed to do. It's a relatively minor uh, problem. It's one that is readily identifiable. The cause is known. This latest fault is sure to add to the criticisms of those people who felt that Canada should have bought many more of a competing aircraft, a fighter that came with a much lower price tag. Fewer little kids living in poverty, household incomes edging up, sounds like good news, but census data released today presents something of a mixed reality for Canadians. Ron Charles reports. This may be Shivana McCalla's best chance to get her life on track. Mm -hmm. The 25-year-old single mother deals with mental health issues, lives in a shelter, and had to leave her two children in the care of relatives. She's in a program called Job Start to learn job hunting skills and possibly land a 12-week paid placement. It's been very difficult. I've been struggling for a year or so. New census numbers may give her some hope by suggesting some families like McCallis have been able to pull themselves out of poverty. The percentage of children under five years of age living below the low-income cutoff fell between 2005 and 2015, down from 18.8 percent to 17.8 percent. Though staff at the United Way charity, the agency that runs Job Start, haven't seen a reduction in demand. What's showing statistic-wise hasn't really changed. I don't think the reality that we're seeing of clients' demand and clients coming in exhibiting or, or letting us know what their needs are and what the reality is. Still, the census numbers suggest Canadians are making more money at many different income levels. The median household income increased by almost 11 percent, from about $63,000 in 2005 to just over $70,000 in 2015. Again, that hasn't decreased demand for help. FoodShare is a non-profit agency that tries to get fresh farm produce at a good price into the hands of people who often don't have access to it. 
That includes students at more than 800 Toronto schools and families living far from grocery stores. If families are trying to negotiate what to do with the limited income that they do have, the, mo like the best that we can do is to provide them with very beautiful, affordable produce so that they can invest those dollars where else they need to. This food share community market in downtown Toronto is one of the places where people with limited income can get fresh food and hold on to some of that badly needed money. Ron Charles, CBC News, Toronto. Let's bring in Jacqueline Hansen now to dig deeper into the story behind those numbers. So what does the data tell us about seniors? Well, it shows that income-wise, more are falling into this low-income bracket. And that jumped out at us because we often hear this generation of seniors referred to as some of the uh, most wealthiest seniors ever. So if you take a look at the low-income households just across the population, you'll see that those for those aged 65 and over, the proportion of low-income households has gone up. So from 12% in 2000, 2005 to 14 and a half percent in 2015 but those numbers don't necessarily tell the whole story I, I spoke with one analyst and he pointed out that many seniors uh, live on a fixed income some of it is tied to inflation but he's not necessarily surprised that those incomes wouldn't be able to keep up with the pack uh, but I did speak with another expert who said that there is reason for concern in this and that's because many seniors or many more seniors are continuing to work uh, twice as many as in the 80s and so while some incomes are going up, it's also uh, potentially leaving some behind. Tell us more about personal experiences you're hearing. Yeah, so I spoke to one woman, Adina. She's 68 years old and she uh, can't retire anytime soon, she says, because she hasn't saved enough money. And she spent some of her time advocating for other seniors, but she's also really concerned about her own future. Well, but people are, are afraid more and more of running out of money takes a lot of money to live. And if you're not earning money and you haven't saved enough and the costs aren't going down, they're going up, then it really heightens the scare factor. Like, you know, what's going to happen to me in, you know, 20 years? And Adina's mom is 97. Huh. And so while her family, you know, that's reason for them to celebrate for Adina and for many others like her, um, that extra time is also financially daunting. So interesting. Thanks so much, Jacqueline. You're welcome. When we come back, remembering a man described by Justin Trudeau as one of the very finest ministers ever to serve this country. I'm Anna Maria Tremonti. Tomorrow on The Current, author and journalist Malcolm Gladwell says that in this time of political and social upheaval, it's time to re-examine our approach to history. Malcolm Gladwell is my guest on The Current, weekdays at 8.30 on CBC Radio 1.
NBC's Tuesday comedy lineup starts September 26th at 8 on CBC. Okay, see you. Universal public Medicare is maybe our proudest achievement as a country. It was the dream of many of us for many years. It was the work of many more. But in 1966, when Prime Minister Pearson needed someone to actually make it happen, to design the legislation to make it happen and to get it through a minority parliament, he turned to Alan Jay. For that and for so many other things, Canada is a better country because he was in it and he served it. May he rest in peace. The Prime Minister today speaking about Alan J. McKechn after the Liberal Cabinet held a moment of silence in his memory. McKechn is being remembered as a skilled politician who believed government should serve the public good as well as a coal miner's son who never forgot where he came from. Tom Murphy looks back at his life. To say Alan J. McKechn had political longevity is an understatement. In his 40-plus years in politics, he won 10 elections. He held many of the big cabinet posts. To begin the Medicare program on July 1st, 1968. Perhaps his proudest accomplishment, the introduction of National Medicare. Well, we're going to get a lot of McKechn support. He also made a run for the federal liberal leadership. Alan McKechn backs Pierre Trudeau. Eventually dropping off the ballot to support Pierre Trudeau. Known for his political acumen behind the scenes, McKechn, Canada's first deputy prime minister, was the architect of many liberal social programs, including the Old Age Security Act. If we attempt to live with inflation... He was also Minister of Finance in the early 1980s, the days of high interest rates and high inflation. His policy of wage restraints proved to be unpopular. I'm not asking the provinces to do any more in the interest of restraint than I'm asking the government of Canada. We will give assistance... To Cape Breton, Alan J. McCacken was the godfather. In an era of bring home the bacon politics, McKechn thrived. I get probably the greatest satisfaction when I'm back in my constituency. In the dying days of coal and steel, McKechn helped bring billions of taxpayers' dollars to Cape Breton. But the one-time economics professor couldn't solve the economic enigma. There was the failed importation of diseased sheep from Scotland, a billion-dollar heavy water plant that opened, then closed and still unemployment rose. Through it all, McKechn was unapologetic. Why does the expenditure of money suddenly become a moral issue when it's Cape Breton? As leader of the Senate, McKechn helped delay passage of the Free Trade Agreement and the GST. At age 75, he was forced out of politics by mandatory retirement. Marking the end of a political career, Jean Chrétien once poked fun at. Oh, he said, I heard that he had a big problem of his back because all those years going to the island, you know, with a pile of cash on his back for the people. The stuff of political legend, shaped by McKechn's almost five decades of public service. Tom Murphy, CBC News, Halifax. Alan J. McKechn was 96 years old. He died last night in hospital in Antigonish, Nova Scotia. Funeral plans have not yet been announced. Before we go tonight, a recap of the day's top stories. A sobering report from the World Wildlife Fund. It's been tracking 900 species in Canada since 1970 and says more than half have shown dramatic decline. The report says the Federal Species at Risk Act isn't doing enough to protect them. And the Kenow wildfire in southwestern Alberta has quadrupled in size over the last three days. Hundreds of people have evacuated from their homes, and wildfire officials are saying the fire has burned out of control and that it remained that way for some time. And that's The National for this Wednesday night. For news at any hour, you can always go to our website, cbcnews.ca. I'm Wendy Nesley. Thanks for watching.